Give us two minutes each of what do you love, what's the focus of the fund, um, and uh, then we're going to jump into questions and continue chatting. It's very free flow. Oh, in this damn fucking chair. <laughs> and, and, and I would, I, I will offer you the same uh, offer that I offered Andy, if you saw that. If you'd like, yes, would you like some more? Well, if anybody would like some, I do have at any time. You, you, got, you got a sniffer? In your, no, I'm, I'm fine. But, uh, okay, all right. Okay, all right. so Anu, I'll could you take it great, away? Great while, you ta while you take a sip of that, Anu, would you, would you give us a little bit of... Sure. Great. Um, so thanks so much, first, for having me. Absolutely. Um, so I am the founding partner of FQ, Female Founders Fund, uh, which is a seed stage fund focused on investing in companies um, founded by women in technology. Uh, primarily based in New York, um, we you know write seed stage checks, so anywhere from 75 to 150k. And um, the fund's thesis is that when you invest in really great female founders, you can get a great venture backable return. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and be quick. I'm a managing director for Comcast Ventures. We invest on behalf of Comcast, NBC, and Universal. There's really two things to understand about our fund. Uh, we are a strategic fund, but we behave exactly like a traditional VC firm, and there's two things that underpin that. The first is that we get compensated like a traditional VC, and that's only important to relay to you to, for entrepreneurs to understand that we're on the same side as the entrepreneur. We're not um, trying to invest into the company to uh, advantage Comcast's interest necessarily. We do well when the entrepreneur does well. We just want our portfolio companies to do as well as possible. The other thing to understand about us is, is that we decision make within the partner group. So as far as entrepreneurs working with us, we look and feel exactly like a traditional VC. But the plus point is, and what I think is exciting about the platform is, we can bring the assets of Comcast and, uh, and NBC and Universal to bear on behalf of our portfolio companies. We get privileged access. And in certain verticals, advertising is an obvious one. Video is an obvious one, which uh, I think is one of the reasons that I'm here. Uh, we, can, we can add value over and above the check. Fantastic. So also a little bit of perspective, because I'm, I'm not sure if you guys were here or yesterday. But um, what I love about this is about a, we had a 350 people registered. There's about 100 here. But remember, everything's video going out everywhere. And we also made a book last year that recapsulated all of the wisdom of our panelists and everybody here. And that gets sent out in another way. So this thing doesn't end as we're kind of eating our own dog food at this, this summit. Um, and so just keep that in the back of your mind as well. He's warning you, by the way. <laughs> that, that was the point of that. Well, I did it after he, I gave him the flask. You see how it's all about marketing, Andy. Um, so uh, I'll let Andy take a break a second because we've been talking a little bit and then rope everybody in. So on that, Andy, so, uh, Andrew, talk a little bit about some of the video companies uh, that you're in yep. and um, what, what are the biggest challenges, you know, of those specifically and what excites you about those opportunities? Obviously Comcast is there, so that's the key piece, but personally you, it's a personal drive to choose those companies. Yeah, so I'll talk about the group a little bit and then I'll talk about uh, one of my companies just to highlight an example. So we, we really think about it in relatively traditional buckets of infrastructure and content and monetization. So infrastructure, uh, it's, uh, it, it's obviously core to our DNA. We move bits around the web as an operating company. So we have a number of investments in things like IP distribution companies. We have invested into um, uh, semiconductor companies, which is quite rare these days for, for a range of funds. So we've invested into image capture, things, little chips that sit behind the the cameras in your smartphones for, uh, uh, for, for those of us in the room. Uh, presumably all of us that have smartphones. Um, and so we step up the kind of uh, the uh, infrastructure layer. If we think about content, we invest into pure play content companies. So we invested into, um, into full screen and taste made a, a couple of uh, better known MCNs. We've invested into a company called Snag Films. We've invested into companies which are increasing. It m maybe didn't start out as, as uh, uh, focusing on image as their, as their core USP, but Flipboard, for example, which is becoming increasingly uh, a visual medium. And then uh, in terms of monetization, we're in VHX with, uh, with Andy and Union Square. Uh, and, uh, and the company that, that perhaps I'll spend a little bit more time on is a company called Sunday Sky. It's a company that uh, is one of my portfolio companies. 
which is really about uh, personalized video. So it breaks apart video streams and it reassembles them in intelligent ways to speak personally to the characteristics of the, of the, of the viewer and the impression at the time. So it can be used in a couple of ways. It can be used as uh, by enterprises to do things like explain particularly complicated propositions. So insurance companies, finance companies, medical companies that need to explain really quite complicated things to its users need personalized video that is appropriate to the particular situation of the viewer. Uh, and there's an advertising side as well. So if, if you imagine um, browsing around through a session on the web, you're interested in a particular set of products, it's possible to present video to you later in that session or maybe uh, even later in the week that um, reflects back some of the interests that, uh, uh, that you've demonstrated in certain products around the web. Um, great. So uh, Anu, I know we talked uh, as we were chatting to get you know, a mixture of people, great people on, 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 on this panel. What I love is the corporate VC, traditional v, uh, later, uh, instit I don't know what, the non-early stage, Series A. Be careful with the words. I please. know, I know. And, uh, and, and, and two more earlier. And so when you have a couple companies in the portfolio that there's a design uh, related, there's culinary related, a bunch of different ones, and they, to what extent are they leveraging images and video, and, and how much do they think that's a part of their business? Sure. So um, if I was to look through the portfolio, I would say um, actually the first investment that we made, which I made personally, um, is probably the one that I think um, leverages images the most. And that's a company called Loverly, okay. which is in the wedding space. And I think, um, you know, the wedding space traditionally has been quite antiquated. There hasn't been a lot of disruption. And I think um, when you look at things from a bride's perspective, um, it's really about, you know, imagination and it's about kind of visualizing what you want that day to look like. And obviously that's definitely translated into very big advertising spends. And um, so I think what Kelly, the founder's goal and vision with Loverly is, is to really try to create a platform which... Um, you know, in some ways has a network because she's aggregating content across, you know, the top wedding blogs and leveraging that to build a community of brides where, um, you know, you have the advertising element um, of it, but then you also have commerce on top of it. So um, so I think that that's a very clear case um, of a company where, you know, um, images are just so crucial to um, the customer's experience that mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine that it didn't exist before. So one of the slides I, I referenced, I think, yesterday was um, the teen audience and where they're spending their time. We know the names of those companies, uh, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Pinterest, and other visual places, which I think wouldn't exist without images or video, okay? At least not to the state that they're in. Um, so I, what, one question I haven't asked any investors on any of the sessions, and I try to keep some to vary it around, is of the companies that are not really leveraging images and video. Do you guys hear at the board level or strategic conversations, maybe we should start. With, I mean, obviously, I have a biased perspective and the summit is biased, but I, I just wonder, of the companies that are not, obviously, there's many that should not, but I think there's many that, like I was talking to Joanne earlier, that she puts one photo on the block and she writes, well, why don't you have all photos? Will it drive more traffic or communicate better? Are there any of the companies that have raised discussions strategically or have come up that says, maybe we should, and how can we? Or maybe it's not in our DNA, should we find somebody to do that? Does that ever come up in any of your discussions? Uh, I'm talking with a, a seed company at the moment where uh, the idea of the company is really to innovate. It, it, you know, 15 years ago, it, it would have been a magazine. And today, it's trying to figure out exactly the right blend of static images, video, and text to be the most compelling proposition it can be. And that's maybe a good example of the kinds of conversations that people are going through. There's some subtleties to how you implement in terms of, in terms of autoplay, in terms of the way that you use audio, in terms of the stills that you use, in terms of the way that you present images through the body of the text, in the way that you um, present the text relative to these images that can dramatically change the way that people actually choose to consume the media. Um, video is obviously much more involving. It requires a little bit more of a, a time and an emotional commitment from the viewer. So um, 
you need to tailor the content as well to the particular use case. If it's, if it's um, things like news, where you're trying to ingest as much information in a short amount of time as possible if you're time constrained, video maybe isn't the most compelling right. format. But if, uh, if uh, it's a little bit more uh, discursive or it is uh, content that we think can l live for a much longer life cycle, uh, then much more interesting to use video. And, and I think the other thing that's interesting is, as a hook for video, established brands, whether people brands or um, brand brands or thought leader authorities, r really interesting complement to video to pull people into that experience. Because you, you, you need a little bit of a hook to pull people into committing to longer time periods, 90 second views, for example. I would say, um, you know, going back to your earlier comment about BarkBox, mm -hmm. um, even though when I look across the portfolio, you know, there are definitely quite a few companies that don't um, involve images or video as a core part of their business. One thing that I think um, all of them have really tried to do is figure out what is the distribution or marketing tool mm -hmm. that um, that their customer base is most attracted to? So, you know, in the early days, you'll test out Pinterest, you'll test out a bunch of different um, kind of channels. And um, I think figuring out what is the type of content, is it video content, um, is it, you know, images on Instagram um, or on Pinterest, um, I think... You know, that to me is similar to BarkBox. It's a way of thinking through how do you add that layer and make make it relevant and what is your customer base most right. um, associate with your brand. It makes a lot of sense. But, I mean, so, but on a timing basis, it seems like that's a recent thing. And I don't know, I still don't know what the signal is that happened. Was it Instagram sale or was it, was it, was it Pinterest? You know, there, it, it was a whole trend which some of us have been, you know, with blinders on in the imaging space for too long as you know who I'm talking about. And, uh, but now it seems like now it's everybody's starting to do it. And do you, does anybody recall a, a signal that, that everybody says, well, we have to, what's our plan for this? Or it's really well, actually you know, happening. Actually, I think it's, I actually think it's, <clears throat> it's a network effect. You want to go where people are. Right? But when did it get big, when did it get a big enough, and so that's the hard question, like you said earlier, is you don't know a network until you, until it is. Yeah, I mean, la I mean it's, re <laughs> it's recent, right? Last, That's right. Is last it last couple, last couple, couple of years? years. Last, yeah, last couple one years. to two years, six yeah. months to four months. Yeah. You know, so it was an interesting, the reference of BarkBox is great because I didn't get to say it earlier where, I, I, as you know, I'm a good, very good friends with him and I helped him in the early days and I wanted to invest, but I'm so focused. And I said, but, but I bet you're going to use, you know, have images and I just know it. Evan, I can't, I mean, you're probably right, but I, 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 we don't have the plans right now. I can't commit to it. I wouldn't, I can't say that which he's great and focused. But I, I know it. Can't we just do it? You can, Evan, but I can't say now that we're going to do that. And, and that was the right answer from him. And, he, and maybe I should have broken my rule, but I, I'm trying to... Yeah, but I, I actually don't... I, you know, there, there, was, there was no way to... Right, there was no way to know that, you could, that there would be dogs who have Instagram accounts that have a million followers, right? I mean, like, no way to know, but it yeah, was just, that, from right? Dogster and other days, yeah. it, was, it was just going to happen. Yeah. So maybe, you know, yeah. I, you know yeah, it's easy to say yeah. now, but that's what I said. Yeah, that was the could, exact conversation. But it goes back to your question, right? Like, all these things are blending, right? And right. So, so you as an investor can break your rules, and you could, you could come up with a rational thesis because these things are blending so much. You know what the most... For, there are a couple of companies I have right now that their most effective marketing channel by far, by far, is YouTube. <laughs> By far, is YouTube. And you know how they do it? They, they find someone on YouTube who makes videos that is somewhat related to what they do, and they send them an email and said, hey, will you review our product? And if you review it, we don't care what you say, put a link in the comments. Right? That's it, right? By far, the conversion rates I actually shouldn't even tell this secret. Right? It so well, right? <laughs> that's interesting. That, that's a perfect example of, of that things that are happening, and that's what I wanted to kind of get to the right. off. Not only in the investment, but what are other companies doing? What should companies do? What 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 will get that to the next spike? Do you have any other examples, either of you? Well, what, one company that um, we haven't yet announced, which um, I think is is really interesting, is um, again focused on YouTube mm -hmm. and the how-to space. Um, which on, in YouTube has just, you know, kind of skyrocketed in terms right. of um, styling and, and fashion. And um, this company is basically creating a mobile video network with tier one and tier two influencers who are creating very short, you know, 30 second to one minute videos on how to put on, you know, mascara, how, you know, various different um, kind of styling and, and fashion tips. And, 
it's interesting because, you know, again, you have the network effect. Um, you don't necessarily need to start with, you know, the most well-known influencers, but they bring their own audience. Right. And, you know, it's not a traditional advertising uh, model in that they've already kind of signed up with brands. So, you know, how do you cuff a sleeve properly um, with Jenna Lyon from J. Crew? Um, you know, talking to J. Crew, video is actually their by far their their most effective advertising tool, and they just don't have enough platforms to to use video as 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 a tool. So, to me, you know, that company hasn't launched yet and can't name it, sure. but um, it's a really interesting way of kind of leveraging YouTube's um, existence, but also acknowledging that you know. 60% of YouTube videos are still viewed um, on, on web and not on mobile. So, um, so that's an interesting company, which I think is kind of taking advantage of. That's great. And I, I was just going to make a slightly different point. I, I, think, uh, I think we're seeing so much activity and will continue to see activity. I think it is a, a, a single inflection point. I don't think it'll be a pendulum swing back again because it, it's not that long since mobile network. It's the interplay between mobile and the... Um, and the, and, the, and the load on the networks that comes from video right. and images. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not that long since mobile networks have been able to support this kind, of, uh, this kind of content. And then it needs a year or 18 months for entrepreneurs to figure out what to do with this new capability. And so things like autoplay and the Facebook stream, things like Instagram, things like Snapchat, just takes a little bit of time for the ecosystem to figure out. Even, even Gmail's innovations around inbox and just threading photos into the stream uh, it, it's taken some time, and I now think all of that stuff is coming to market. It's clear that the future of web is going to be far more visual. You're giving me a flashback to a 10K file taking 10 minutes to download it on a 96 baud modem. Right. Right. What's that sound? Can anybody make that sound? Do, 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 do. Come on, Andy. They don't even know what you're talking about. I know about they don't. Too. They're young. <laughs> um, so anybody have questions? I'm going to keep on asking questions, but I'd love it to make it interactive. We've got about 12 minutes left. So uh, feel free to raise your hand if you've got questions. Um, what questions do you guys have for each other? I have one while you guys start thinking about questions. So um, since the most important thing to me, and I think to all of us, um, is uh, it's all about the people. It's all about the entrepreneurs. It's all about you guys and us. Um, what do you love and hate about your job? So I can start. Um, Good. So ah, shit. <laughs> um, Sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with what I love. Um, so I would say the part that I love about my job is, um, you know, obviously meeting entrepreneurs and, and kind of seeing what um, over time new business models emerging, new industries that are being disrupted. Um, and as an investor, I think you have the advantage, unlike an operator, where you're very singly focused of um, kind of getting to see a little bit of everything. Um, I think what I really dislike about my job is that um, you spend a significant portion of time saying no. And um, having been an uh, entrepreneur before, it in some ways it goes against kind of your makeup, which is to, you know, try to help and build things and help people. And so um, I would say that's, that's something that I'm still, you know, trying to get, get better at. That's great. So uh, I'm terrified of being bored in my job. I have been in jobs where I have been bored, and it is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible place to be. This job is fascinating. You're always intellectually challenged. You're very rarely the smartest person in the room. People are explaining. It's, a, it's an incredible privilege to, to have a job where people are explaining their deepest passions to you and providing you with insight all day. So, uh, so uh, there's incredible intellectual variety. That's, that's the highlight of my job. I, I, there, there really aren't many lowlights. I do love what I do. I, I think if I was to point to anything, it, it's a slow cycle in terms of um, seeing the fruits of your work. So you only start to see in five or six years time really how good you are. It would be nice to have a shorter kind of cycle of feedback, I would say. Yeah, that's one of the things that I can't stand going from, well, at least you didn't curse like me. I, mine came out. Uh, the, uh, going from the entrepreneur, I think we're all, we've all been entrepreneurs. So this is a great operator slash investor group, which I love. Um, yeah, the biggest thing I, I struggle with is when I was entrepreneurial, you daily, weekly felt like you either were moving the ball forward quickly, slowly, or not at all, or going backwards. You knew. There were metrics that you really knew. 
um, and doing this, I've gotten used to it, and I still and I love it. But it is a whole different game, of which you're also not in control. Um, you're you have a perception that you're more in control as an entrepreneur, and you might be, but we're never really in control, right? Um, you know, related related to that, the thing that <clears throat> I think is pretty interesting about venture um, is that it's a really um, it's a it's a near perfect system for allocating very risky capital, right? And so and so your question was, what do you love about it? One of the things that I love about it is that we are in the business of constructing portfolios right. um, that hopefully are diversified in a manner that we that we define, um, but um, <clears throat> but we're not we're not in the business of having to be right all the time. We're actually probably in the business of having to be right once every five years, and so. Um, and so that's a pretty interestingly constructed environment, um, which I like. The thing I dislike the most is exactly that, right? <laughs> which, is, which is that you're going to, if you're good at it, you're probably going to be wrong 70, 80, 90% of the time. And that also that that creates, you know, the relationship between us and our companies is, is vastly asymmetrical. You know? Right. I mean, so that's why I ask it because yeah. we talk frequently on many of these different panels. I like talking about yeah. because of our dual perspective and everybody here. What's the perspective of the entrepreneur of yeah. the investors? What's the investor's yeah. perspective? What do you like and dislike? And that's how yeah. we try to figure out how we can work together. Well, because it's there's like, not it's everybody's like a good success, fit. The success, the success of your company. Like I invest in you and I invest in 23 other companies and construct me a portfolio. The success of your company is kind of irrelevant to me, to my portfolio, right? But the six of your company is actually all you have, right? So I find the way to one way to resolve that is just to be upfront about that, right? To be upfront that that's the relationship. Which is why I like bringing it up here because it's a, it is a real thing, um, and they're all relevant. But it actually is not life or death. I think is the, is the situation, right? So you want, I mean, it's a, it's a percentage game where you're building a portfolio and 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 everybody working together to try to figure out how to make them all successful. As yeah, a goal, yeah, ideally, but, 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 they, but, but the, the numbers be. are numbers, right? They're, they're not, not going to be, right? They're not going to be. Right, yep, yeah, sorry. Uh, questions in the audience? Yes, great, over there. Stand up. I will do. Great. Um, Andrew, I, well, I just dropped my iPhone, but that's okay. Andrew, I have a question for you. you Andy or Andrew? Andrew. That one. Yeah. Andy. Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were looking at Andy, so I'm glad I clarified. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to because it will be quite an irrelevant question, maybe it's what... Um, you've mentioned earlier about investing in network businesses. And the good thing about network businesses is that they are very defensible and you have great barriers to entry. Fantastic. At the same time, usually it's winner takes it all markets. And that really increases the risk. So do you think that is a quite high risk strategy? And how do you mitigate that risk? Um, yes, it is a high risk strategy. and. We're, we're not in the business of mitigating. We accept that risk because that's the risk that drives returns that are meaningful to our investors, you know, to allow them to invest in an illiquid security that, where they won't see return for 10 years. I mean, that's the dynamic that we want, right? I don't know if things are – I have a question in my mind, and we talk about this at USV, whether things are still winner-take-all or winner-take-most, but that's separate. But, we, but that's a dynamic – you know, binary outcomes drive drive the returns that make our investors happy. And if our investors are happy, we are happy. And if our investors aren't, we aren't. So I don't. It's that's a feature, not a bug, maybe. Now, the more interesting question to me is that that's not necessarily a mode that is appropriate, or that that's not necessarily a mode that every entrepreneur ha should aspire to. Right, and so there are lots of there are lots of flavors of running a business. There are lots of flavors of being an entrepreneur. There are lots of flavors of financing your company. There are lots of flavors of exiting and getting liquid from the investment you make in your company. We are just one flavor, but we're a flavor that that requires outsized return, or it doesn't work. Any other questions? Yes, great up here. Mike is coming your way, Jeffrey. Um, it's for mainly Andrew. Um, you, you mentioned that um, companies are only now utilizing the uh, bandwidth of mobile networks, and um, um, with the gigabit networks coming, I, I, I saw a demonstration of Google Fiber, and they were just playing 10 videos at the same time, which is not re really what people are going to be doing. So uh, have you started to see what people are going to be actually doing with this besides higher resolution or you know the boring stuff? Uh, 
There certainly is higher resolution. It, it may be boring, but 4K is going to stress these networks. These networks are, I, I don't think it's that well known by the general public how stressed these networks are by the rise of video. It's, it's really pretty dramatic. And, uh, and the network operators are having to invest um, large sums of money to, to keep pace and to make sure that people get the experiences that they need. 4K is going to be interesting. Augmented reality is going to be interesting. VR is going to be interesting. These are all very bandwidth intensive uh, applications that are going to stress the network. But I'd say even more than that, and just to take our US hats off for a second, you think about the infrastructure in internationally and the fact that plenty of people in the world can't access some of the most basic picture-oriented services, that is also a challenge. Any other questions in the audience? Like I said earlier, if you don't raise your hand, we don't know who you are. Um, any questions among here? I have more. I'm not lacking. I'm go for go it. Go for it. Okay. Um, we ask questions all day. I know. We're tired We're by now. <laughs> No comment. Um, so let, let, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, the virtual reality, augmented reality, I, I knew, I know you mentioned in the email that you don't have any of those, but I just want to, it seems like a latest trend, you know, and what do we think about it? Is it really here this time? Let's say virtual reality and the, the, the wearing Oculus, and, and is it really going to meet the hype within the next two years, or are we... You know, for anybody who wants to talk about it, or is it really going to take another 10 to 20 years? Anybody want to answer? Uh, yeah, I'll give you... Uh, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I'll give you my personal point of view, because my right. group is quite uh, split around this point. I think a lot of people are split. That's why I want to be just individually is in perspective. Yeah, so our group has spent time with Oculus. Our group has spent time with Magic Leap, two of the more interesting companies in the space. It, it, it feels magical when you experience these services, m my personal point of view is that it's going to take a long time, longer than people expect. It's going to be fundamentally world changing, but it's going to take a long time. And I think, you know, investing is partly about understanding when to invest. And so um, I think these are very important technologies. I think in 30 years time, they're going to change the way our world works in many, many ways. So Andrew, I agree. I got to jump in because uh uh, the definition of a long time for you, yeah. an entrepreneur, my sister, me, and everybody else in this room, is totally different. It's the same kind of question of what's a lot of money. A lot of money is very different to every single person in right. this room. You know, there's enough money to eat and there's plain money. Yeah. Um, they're different. So what's a long time to you? It's going to take a long time to, to get to, you know, the tipping point that we just talked about, about images really being marketing and trending. When does that happen for VR? Uh, Roughly. Within... 10 years, 20 years, I mean, like time frame. Are we five years, 10 years, 30? Let me answer it slightly differently, which yeah. is in order for us to be interested, we need to see something happening within the next Forget the invest, forget Comcast. Oh, forget, okay, all right, so. When is it gonna happen? Which then relates to when you'd be interested, obviously. But when's it, you know, I, I, gut, clearly your gut. I don't have an answer for that, but let me give you, okay. let me give you just a stab in the dark. You know I'm the, tough I, sometimes. I, I, think the te I think the technology will arrive ahead of scaled usage because I think the content will take time. Agree? I, I think uh, Agree. Like creating that corpus of content that's really interesting is going to take six, seven, eight years before we're really using these services on a daily, weekly basis. Six to eight years? Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think? I have, I have no idea. <laughs> I, 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 I knew I, any I, idea? I have no idea. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll play the discussion because I asked the question. So, I mean, I'm trying to figure this out because I'm looking at a lot of these companies. I'm putting them on, and I think it's fascinating, and I get dizzy sometimes. And, you know, what are the use cases other than a couple of the obvious ones, which are the leading edge of all technologies anyway? Yeah. Um, but I think it's going to be infrequently used. I think in mirrors of images and, and VR and the content, it's going to be unbelievable world-changing like you. But I think it's going to take much longer because I don't think enough people We'll use it for yeah, but 10 know, to 15 you know, you years. Know what's an, you know what's an interesting question is that, yeah, I think it's hard. They, the, the pace of change is so ridiculous. It mm -hmm. really is hard to, it's hard to predict anything. But, but so the one thing, though, that you can do is I look at, you know, 
we have a we have a we have an incredibly healthy and rich ecosystem for entrepreneurs to exist as entrepreneurs, and it didn't exist five years ago or ten years ago, and it sure as hell didn't exist when I started in the business, you know. And so, and so, entrepreneurs are really freaking smart. Like I just watch what they do, right? Like that dude's building that camera, right? And so. I wouldn't have thought of that camera with like six things. And so I'm like, they'll fill gaps, you know, right. in ways that I think we don't see because we're up at a higher level. And that to me is, is a little, is maybe a little more indicative, right. you know? Sure. And so, no, I think you're absolutely right. I, I'm just getting, you know, I don't like putting set times, but I, and I've been bleeding edge a little too often with yeah. my article in 2003 that camera phones are replaced point and shoot cameras and other yeah. ones. And, well, and right. I, I was right, but I was just like, you know, just different you're wrong right, time. Uh, I'm right about satellite. It might not be our lifetime, the satellite selfie, but I, I think I'm right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't need to be right. But let's, so we're just uh, out of time, but I have a couple, two questions that are short answers just to uh, what I frequently do, and I like the mixture of everybody's different views. One is, uh, give me the, in one word answers, the personality trait that you love and hate. We talked about this earlier. And then the second uh, question will be, I'll, I'll ask it afterward, let's focus on this. The one word you love and hate, the personality trait of entrepreneurs, I know? Um, hustle. Hustle is what you love, that's great. I love it because, um, you know, I think that you need it as an entrepreneur to kind of, um, you have to be resilient and to be able to keep going with a lot of rejection. Um, but, you know, sometimes it can be annoying. <laughs> so so you, you're the, you love and hate the same yeah. word. Oh, we've got a trend going on here, Andy. You started yeah. this trend. Uh, Andrew? Transparency. And that means intellectual honesty to me. I find that entrepreneurs tend to divide into two camps. One is here's my business, here are my challenges, L let's figure through this together and kind of uh, fake it till you make it. And, and I prefer working with the former. Great. Andy, you already did yours. You want to go again? You want to, no, you're, you're, stick, you're sticking to it. Mind. Good man. <laughs> All right, then you can start on the next one. So the, on the last one, the closing one is one sentence of entrepreneur hats, not VC hats, the operator hats. The one sentence advice to entrepreneurs building a business. And it might be the same for both hats, but... Put the entrepreneur hat on with all your experiences. What's the advice? Um, God, one, just one. One damn, sentence. One, oh I God. just like sound bites. Anybody want to go? Andy's thinking. I can go. Go, go um, you know. So my one piece of advice would be to surround yourself um, in whatever capacity you can, advisors, mentors, um, investors, hopefully, uh, with people who are knowledgeable about the industry that you're entering. Um, majority of entrepreneurs I meet um, don't necessarily come from the industry, and I think that's a good thing. So um, if you don't and you're willing to disrupt, then try to at least get market knowledge by um, the community around you. Great. Set three-month, six-month, 12-month goals. Make sure they're consistent. They, you don't have to stick to them religiously. You can alter them on the field of battle as circumstances change. But quite often you'll sit down with an entrepreneur and they'll sketch out what they're trying to do now and where they think they'll be in a year, and there isn't the coherency. Okay, great. Great advice, Andy. I think, um, you know, to, to think, you know, give a lot of thought to whether when you, when you hear no, whether that's a positive indicator or a negative indicator. You know, and be really kind of honest in thinking about it because it, it often, it, in different circumstances, it's both. Uh, that's great. And so I want to riff on that on mine, and then we'll end this. Um, uh, in my mind, uh, yeah, no never means no. It means not now. Until you evolve to either validation from customers, significant others, or parents in anything in life, no never means no. It's just not a yes yet. The yes could take a long time, but that's my advice. So round of applause. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Awed with this panel. And uh, we're moving on. Thank you very much.